And so the peace conference came and went, and there was no consolation for the troubled men of the Upper South, who did not want to secede, but were resolved not to abandon local autonomy. Virginia was the key to the situation. If Virginia could be forced into secession, the rest of the Upper South would inevitably follow. Therefore, a Virginia hothead, Roger A. Pryor, being in Charleston in those days, poured out his heart in fiery words. Using a Charleston crowd to precipitate war in the certainty that Virginia would then have to come to their aid. When at last Sumter was fired upon and Lincoln called for volunteers, the second stage of the secession movement ended in a thunderclap. The third period was occupied by the second group of secessionists. Virginia on the 17th of April, North Carolina and Arkansas during May, Tennessee early in June. Sumter was the turning point. The boom of the first cannon trained on the island fortress deserves all the rhetoric it has inspired. Who was immediately responsible for that firing which was destiny. Ultimate responsibility is not upon any person. War had to be. If Sumter had not been the starting point, some other would have been found. Nevertheless, the question of immediate responsibility, of whose words it was, that served as the signal to begin, has produced an historic controversy. When it was known at Charleston that Lincoln would attempt to provision the fort, the South Carolina authorities referred the matter to the Confederate authorities. The cabinet, in a fateful session at Montgomery, hesitated, drawn between the wish to keep their hold upon the moderates of the North, who were trying to stave off war, and the desire to precipitate Virginia into the list. Toombs, Secretary of State in the new government, wavered, then seemed to find his resolution and came out strong against a demand for surrender. It's suicide, murder, and will lose us every friend at the North. It is unnecessary. It puts us in the wrong. It is fatal, said he. But the cabinet and the president decided to take the risk. To General Beauregard, recently placed in command of the militia assembled at Charleston, word was sent to demand the surrender of Fort Sumter. On Thursday, the 7th of April, beside his instructions from Montgomery, Beauregard was in receipt of a telegram from the Confederate commissioners at Washington, repeating newspaper statements that the Federal Relief Expedition intended to land a force which will overcome all opposition. There seemed no doubt that Beauregard did not believe that the expedition was intended merely to provision Sumter. Probably everyone in Charleston thought that the federal authorities were trying to deceive them, that Lincoln's promise not to do more than provision Sumter was a mere blind. Fearfulness that delay might render Sumter impregnable lay back a Beauregard's formal demand on the 11th of April for the surrender of the fort. Anderson refused but made some verbal observations to the aides who brought him the demand. 
In effect, he said that lack of supplies would compel him to surrender by the 15th. When this information was taken back to the city, eager crowds were in the street of Charleston discussing the report that a bombardment would soon begin. But the afternoon passed, night fell, and nothing was done. On the beautiful terrace along the sea known as East Battery, people congregated, watching the silent fortress whose brick walls rose sheer from the midst of the harbor. The early hours of the night went by, and as midnight approached, and still there was no flash from either the fortress or the shore batteries which threatened it, the crowd broke up. Meanwhile, there was anxious consultations at the hotel where Beauregard had fixed his headquarters. Pilots came in from the sea to report to the general that a federal vessel had appeared off the mouth of the harbor. This news may well explain the hasty dispatch of a second expedition to Sumter in the middle of the night. At half after one Friday morning, four young men, aides of Beauregard, entered the fort. Anderson reported his refusal to surrender at once, but admitted that he would have to surrender within three days. Thereupon the aides held a council of war. They decided that the reply was unsatisfactory and wrote out a brief note which they handed to Anderson informing him that the Confederates would open fire upon Fort Sumter in one hour from this time. The note was dated 3.20 a.m. The aides then proceeded to Fort Johnston on the south side of the harbor and gave the order to fire. The Council of the Aides at Sumter is the dramatic detail that has caught the imagination of historians and has led them, at least in some cases, to yield to a literary temptation. It is so dramatic, that scene of the four young men holding in their hands, during a moment of absolute destiny, the fate of a people. Four young men in the irresponsible ador of youth, refusing to wait three days and forcing war at the instant. It is so dramatic that one cannot judge harshly the artistic temper which is unable to reject it. But is the incident historic? Did the four young men come to Sumter without definite instructions. Was their conference really anything more than a careful campaigning and comparing of notes to make sure they were doing what they were intended to do? Is not the real clue to the event a message from Beauregard to the Secretary of War telling of his interview with the pilots?